automating application security bug hunting. Thank you. All right. Can everybody hear us okay? Check, good in the back. Great, awesome. awesome. My name is Jonathan. Uh, I am a uh, information security professional, with a question mark. And uh, I am at Kenna Security and um, have a little project we're going to talk about today called Intrigue, and previously at Bug Crowd and Rapid7. Uh, I'm Jerry Gamblin. I'm a rank amateur if Jonathan is just a professional question mark. I am the professional security engineer at uh, Kenna, and you, you can... You misspelled security. That's... That would explain it. That's I it. I see it. Got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you saw the joke. All right. Uh, my blog's at jerrygamblin.com. Oh, too many. All right. So I had a talk ready to go here, and I kept bouncing ideas off of Jay Cran. I'm like, oh, what about this? What about this? And he's like, oh, I have this cool project that I've been working on that's 100 times better than all of these Python and shell scripts keep sending me that barely work. So he is kind of like my Mr. Miyagi. So I decided that while I had another talk today about building an information security program that I would just work with Jonathan on this because it's probably way more useful for more people for him to talk about intrigue and to talk about the data we can get out of there versus me talking about some really, really poorly written shell scripts. But when you think of, just, just to kind of base this out here, when you start to think about application security, everybody knows burp and burp is the gold standard. Uh, why is that, Jonathan? I mean, it just, it, it, it is the tool that I learned on, it's the tool that you probably learned on, um, and, and a lot of the depth first testing has to happen in a proxy. So, uh, you know, burp really is the gold standard. It is the thing that I think of when I think of application security testing. Yeah, every time I see a bug bounty submission, it has a burp screenshot in it. <laughs> Got too many. So, while we're just talking about expanding the data you can get out of your automation, we wanted to talk about a few of the tools that we love to look at in Burp. Uh, the attack surface detector allows you to automatically scan a web host to try to figure out what is installed in there, what frameworks, what applications. Um, I haven't had a chance to use Turbo Intruder yet, but I, yet. I, I figure out it's a, I've heard it's an amazing way to, to DOS yourself. Just a show of hands, how many folks have heard of Turbo, Turbo Intruder? Okay, a good number. Um, just a, a quick aside on that. Effectively what it's doing is holding the connection open and allowing you to send request after request after request and then collecting them all in, on the way back uh, in order to speed up the process of brute forcing a lot. Um, and so that's uh, James Kettle's project, yep. I think. Uh, and so I would definitely recommend checking that out if you're doing any sort of web testing. Be careful on the server that you're testing on though. You will <laughs> knock it over. And I use active buckets a lot in Burp. It allows you to give a AWS and a GCP key, and when you're burping traffic through there, it'll tell you if it finds a bucket that is either publicly open or open that your key can read. And I see that misconfiguration a lot. You'll go in and you'll stop it from being open to the public, but if you supply a valid key, it'll give you all the data out of it. Me? Yep, go for it. All right, so uh, with that said, you know, it, it, it seems to us as we kind of sat down and thought about this a little bit, we still have the problems, uh, you know, with, with all the testing that's happening and, and, you know, there's always more testing needed. We still have all these problems of unauthenticated databases, exploitable legacy systems, exposed web vulnerabilities, uh, uh, and misconfigured services. So, so there's something missing uh, in, you know, web testing that isn't happening today. And any thoughts on that? No, no, I think you're exactly right. We, we wanted to hope that moving to cloud would get rid of shadow IT. It's just made it worse. And there's, you know, as I think about uh, the bug bounties and I think about all the tools and the, the sources that are available to us, I mean, there's a lot of them. Uh, and this is just a, I got tired of typing them out, so I, I literally stopped. Uh, but, you know, you get the sense. There's just tons of stuff out there that's, helpful in finding these misconfigurations, these bugs, uh, the, the shadow IT. Um, so, so again, where's the problem? What's going wrong? 
And um, you know, bug bounties really do provide uh, an important safety net. And uh, as I, you know, as we look across organizations that are running bug bounties, we find that they're often much more secure on the external perimeter. So, you know, this this is definitely a good step in the right direction. But still, uh, there, there's still lots of things to be found even on organizations that are running a bug bounty because it's a great safety net, but it doesn't offer full coverage. So, and that's the issue, is when you have a bug bounty program or if you have any program, it's only scoped to what people looked at. I've had a regular pen test. You say, hey, we look at my website and they spend 30 of their 40 hours looking at your purchase path, which might be what you want them to do, but it might miss some major vulnerabilities in your network. So the tool that JCRAN's built and that I really like helps you get a more holistic view of everything in your environment. Yeah, and this isn't to say that bug bounties aren't sufficient or, or they're, that yeah. they're not necessary. Um, it, rather, that they aren't necessary, they're not sufficient. There's just so much attack surface uh, that you really want your bug bounty focused on understanding the application and digging into the details of the application as opposed to sort of these broad uh, problems. And so, you know, there's really just inherent complexity uh, in, in the uh, network today. And so how do we get ourselves to uh, uh, more coverage, you know, how do we get rid of some of these fundamentals? And, and why actually is this so hard? I mean, Rich Mogul had a pretty interesting tweet on this just the other day. The, literally the hardest problem in security is solving those simple problems, asset, asset management, vulnerability management, you know, some of the basic problems, solving those at scale. Yep, so I put this slide, the previous, oh, wrong one, go back. This slide here is my favorite slide because if you think of this picture of San Francisco as your CMDB, and I tell you, can you show me everywhere on this map that you can get a good hot dog or that you can get a good slice of pizza? How easy would that be for you to do? It would be pretty hard, right? Like you could guess and you could try to, try to figure it out and you could pick out the obvious places that you know, but you would never be able to get them all, right? And that's the problem we have with CMDBs today, is while you might get 80% coverage in a really, really good environment, you're never getting 100% coverage. I have not had an honest conversation with anybody who runs a CMDB that will claim that they have more than 80% of their assets fully covered inside that, that tool. And this is where we want to get, right? We want to get away from the, hey, let's look at all of, all of San Francisco for, for your, you know, for where the best pizza is, to get into something like this where you're just looking at a micro at something small and really figuring out the minutia of what you're looking for. Yeah, visibility is really a challenge. Um, and so, you know, as we think about uh, visibility and we think about finding problems, there's really three keys that I want to talk about today. I want to talk about that broad array of sources. You know, we saw that slide with all those different tools and sources and things on it. That's super important to be able to get information from a bunch of different places. But there's two things that are really missing today, uh, and that's an ontology and recursion against that ontology. Hey, Jonathan, I obviously know what an ontology means because I'm really, really smart, yeah. but that word gets thrown around a lot. Can you just let somebody who might not know what ontology means? Yeah, so, so when, when we say ontology, what we mean is, is a, you know, a, a set of concepts uh, such as things, you know, entities, uh, really uh, the relationships between those things being fleshed out and, and sort of built into the code. And so, you know, when you think about uh, brute forcing DNS or, or you know, looking for systems by scanning Nmap, Nmap doesn't understand the output that comes out of it, and you have to interpret that output, tell it that it's not, it, it is an IP address to be able to use it, right? Which has to happen in your brain. So uh, can we build that into the code, and can we have that sort of recursive process where if we find an IP address, we know to scan it? And if we have a, 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 you know, a set of ports, can we look into those ports more deeply? So, um, you know, we're really talking about coverage here, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about a personal project of mine, uh, and it's called Intrigue Core. And so, you know, it implements some of these concepts in the form of tasks, which give us lots of sources, entities, which give us that ontology, you know, an entity would be like a domain or it would be an IP address, and it has this concept of machines. 
which will give you recursion. And this might sound really familiar. Multigo has very similar concepts, right? Um, but it, it lacks that ability to automate. Um, but if you're familiar with that, that's kind of how, that's a good way to think about it. And so here's a set of sources, tasks, that are available in this tool today. And, and you, might, you might see some things that are, look familiar here. Shodan, uh, Census, probably very familiar. And, uh, you know, these are, these are more the ones that are highlighted now are more like the databases, places where you can go search and pull information out, right? And there are tools that also pull from these sources. Uh, Spiderfoot is one that comes to mind. Um, Amass is another that comes to mind that searches from different sources. But these are uh, just some of them. Those are more like databases. These are more like misconfiguration checks. So if you can't see it down below, it's you know like Google Calendar check, Google Groups check, um, email brute forcing, GitRob, which we just added today. Uh, and how many folks have used GitRob? Quite a few? Okay, cool. If you haven't used it, effectively what it does is you point it at an organization in GitHub. It'll go download all the different repos. It'll look at all the users of that particular organization. It will download all their repos, and then it will essentially statically analyze it for things like secrets or leaked secrets. And so it, you know, it tends to be a very handy tool, um, but how do you know that you got all the different organizations that could belong to a given organization? And so really, like, you know, this tooling is built with the idea of pointing it at an organization and grabbing everything. And so there's, you know, and today we're talking a lot about web application testing, and here's some, you know, specific tasks focused on web application security. Uh, brute forcing credentials out of a, a URI looking for uh, security headers, uh, looking for focus content. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And even some vulns uh, that we can run against an application. But, you know, I mean, this, this is sounding more and more like DB Autopone, uh, if you're familiar with Metasploit. Uh, back in the day, uh, you could use DB Autopone to just run every module against everything. But the problem with that was you were kind of spraying vulnerabilities against everything, and sometimes you'd actually knock services over. So there's a, there was a missing piece with DB Autopone, um, and that was really understanding the uh, ontology of what it was testing. And so when we talk about entities, uh, we need to understand these different types of things. Uh, we need to understand these different entities. And so, you know, built into Intrigue is these concepts of entities, you know, a domain, a network service, and there can be different types of network services, right? You could have an SMB service, you could have an HTTP service. So this even goes further down, but just to give you a sense of the types of concepts. And so I'll just run you through this uh, from a user interface perspective, because this might uh, help understand it. And it looks pretty good on the screen. Um, I'm not a front end person, so uh, you can think of this as you know, a pretty awful interface, but it serves the purpose. And so notice that there's a task. It's called create entity in this case, which literally does exactly what you might expect. It creates an entity. And it's gonna create an entity in this case of type domain. And we're gonna do it against yahoo.com. And you can kind of ignore the machine and the iterations for now, uh, but understand that those are things that will give us recursion. Once we have a domain, go do more things. But for right now, we're not gonna do any iterations but we are gonna enrich this domain as soon as we get it. And so, you know, hey, it looks it up, you get your IPv6, you get your IPv4 addresses, uh, but there's this concept of enrichment that allows you to completely build that entity out, right? And that's important for our ontology because we wanna know that we have a complete domain, we get all the MX records, we get all the text records, we get everything, before we continue on with more stuff. So we use enrichment, and notice that this also has uh, uh, the ability to see enrichment here. And it has this concept of scoping. And scoping's pretty simple, but it is built into it. Um, scoping basically says, if we entered this ourselves, it's scoped, and if it follows one of the paths that we trust, meaning it pulled information from a source we trust, it'll bring it in scope. And you can check to make sure that uh, you don't actually go scan the entire internet, right? Which would be 
you know, useful, but probably not what you're looking for if you're only looking for one organization or one small set of things. And so it keeps track of all this information nicely in effectively a graph database. Uh, it's Postgres, but uh, you, you can think of it like a Neo4j in its implementation that I've set it up with. And what that allows you to do is when you just look up a domain, it'll grab everything. And remember, that domain probably is a load balanced domain, and it goes through all these different IP addresses. So when you're scanning yahoo.com, actually you're scanning all that stuff, or you should, you know? Um, and if you, you, you probably notice if you point and map it, a, a domain, uh, it may scan one of the IP addresses, but it won't scan all of them, right? So um, if we take this and, and we pull it away from a domain and we point it at a URI, Right, so we just do a create entity URI, yahoo.com. It goes out and it grabs all this information associated with that particular URI. And it grabs a screenshot. And the nice thing is you can iterate here in this interface and continue on with more tasks manually, or you can have it automatically run tasks. And, you know, hang on, going back to that idea of how do we not make, sh how do we make sure that we don't you know, literally throw everything at the wall, you need really good fingerprinting. Um, and so there's this library from Rapid7. It's called Recog. Uh, a guy named John Hart uh, built this. And it's really good on the network side. And this is just an example of a check. Yes, it's XML. Yes, that's terrible. Um, but it is free as in freedom, meaning, you know, you can use this whatever you want, however you want. It's open, you can contribute to it. It's easy to extend, it's relatively comprehensive on the network side, but we're really working on the application side and there really wasn't anything else out there that was all of these different properties. Um, so there's a library that I've built called it Ident that, you know, thrown a, a URL, I just threw security B-sides at it just a minute ago. It'll find the fingerprint, it'll find uh, some, some various configuration information around it. Uh, and, you know, hey, it found Jack Daniels' Gmail address, which is nice. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> uh, but we can use that enrichment process to match vulnerabilities. So if we can figure out what software it's running, it's relatively simple to take the CVE database and point it at that particular piece of software and come back with a list of vulnerabilities. Now, I'm not saying yahoo.com is running this. This is a different uh, site, but you can see, if we can figure out that it's Apache Tomcat, we can figure it's uh, 6.014, we know that we can match that to vulnerabilities because the CVE database now publishes versions, right? Which is nice. It allows us to iterate through all the CVEs, find versions that are less than this, and then match those to this site. So let's put these concepts in action to take an organization, right? And again, we're organization focused here broadly discover assets, enumerate their app stacks, and identify issues. So um, one, one quick aside before we do that, there's this really great project called DNS Grep that got released earlier this month, and it's by this guy, Irby Sam. If you can't see it, uh, thank you to him. And he took the, who's familiar with the sonar data from Rapid7? Two, three, quite a few folks. Okay, so, uh, uh, Sonar is this project to scan the entire internet and uh, bring that data into, uh, where's it hosted at now? I think it's hosted at opendata.rapid7.com. Thank you, Todd. And that uh, information is really great. The problem is it's so big that trying to do anything with it, notice the upper left here, uh, it'll take 10, 15 minutes to get through looking for, you know, ermysam.com, a very small site, presumably, right? Yahoo.com will take even way longer. It could take hours to get information back. So, you know, that kind of puts you in a tough spot when you're on a test and you're trying to do this very quickly. So Irby Sam built this, uh, it's essentially a binary search. He noticed that uh, DNS works, you know, backward to front. You know, everything starts at the .com root and then Irby Sam is below that, and then all the others are below that. So you can build a binary search, and a binary search allows you to effectively speed this process way up, so he's doing it in less than 0 .002 seconds, so like milliseconds. And so that's pretty cool, we should use that. Um, and he released all the code, it's in Go, 
Um, that stuff's publicly available. You can go Google for it. Um, if you have questions about it, come up to me after, and I'll happily point you toward it. Anyway, we built a task around that. That task allows us to query that server for yahoo.com and just dump information about Yahoo's assets, right? And then create those entities in the, in the application and effectively bring all that information together so that you now have a broad set of assets for an organization, specific to an organization. But, you know, really, again, we're here to talk about applications. How do we get to applications? Right? We need this concept of machines. Because when we see a domain, we should go search Sonar, exactly what we just did, which will give us back uh, addresses, which we should look up, which will happen through the enrichment process. And then, when we get IP addresses, we just scan them. Right? And this is kind of pseudocode. Um, these machines are pretty easy to configure. So you can kind of add in the types of things you want. You know, you don't necessarily have to do just this stuff. Um, but this will give us a list of applications because every time we get an IP address, we'll just scan it, right? And if we get a network range, let's just mass scan it, right? Let's make it really simple and fast. And so, you know, see, you see very quickly, you just get tons of information about the attack surface of a given organization, right? And so, I'm not sure which organization this is. This is just an example. Um, but it kind of gives you a sense. You know, there's a lot of attack surface out there for any given organization. And because we do that CPE matching process, we're able to sort of pull vulnerabilities out of this. And so, you know, again, that's mostly infrastructure level stuff. Now you will see some uh, vulnerabilities uh, oriented toward WordPress. And you'll notice, um, I wish I'd put a slide in for this, um, there's, a, uh, there's a lot more uh, CVE level vulnerabilities these days in the frameworks. And so this, uh, you know, this, this ends up being a pretty valuable process if you're doing a bug bounty um, and matching to vulnerabilities and then matching those back to exploitable stuff. One thing I'm not doing today that I will do is to say which of these are remotely, execute, remotely exploitable. Um, I don't note that today, but it's relatively simple to do that with the CVSS scores. So, now, now that we've got all these applications, um, do you wanna talk about this, Jerry? These no, no, I'll do the next one. Cool. Um, so, so there's a bunch of different resources out there that are very helpful in finding uh, web or exploitable web uh, issues. And uh, up on the upper left, you see Seclis. How many folks are familiar with Seclis? Yep, quite a few, good. Um, how many folks are familiar with Payloads All the Things over here? A few less, but mm -hmm. still some, some pretty good amount. And the FuzzDB project? Yep, cool, okay, so you guys have seen this before. Um, ultimately, uh, what this will allow you to do is now that we've got a good fingerprinting process, we can actually take these paths and map them into the tool, and again, kick that off automatically so just an example of this, because we can fingerprint ASP.NET, we can go look for trace AXD, which still works, yep. right? And in fact, we can even pull out a better version because ASP.NET doesn't give us the version, uh, the specific version, it only gives us the sort of high level version, which is not useful for vulnerability matching. Um, cold fusion, uh, there was just recently, I think two days ago, a cold fusion bug uh, that required uh, file upload but it's a RC, and there's still quite a bit of cold fusion out there on the internet. Um, so, you know, being able to find cold fusion is a pretty useful thing. Uh, that particular bug required file upload, so I've added into ident the ability to check for file upload. Can we find that on the site? And I'm not spidering uh, the sites by default, but you could create a machine that spidered the sites automatically as well. Um, also, if you're familiar with Arachne, you can also use Arachne to, to grab information off the site and just do the scans. Um, so, a lot of that was focused on organization-centric things. Yeah. Jerry, you wanna talk about this one? Yeah, yeah, so we wanted to, to give you guys a takeaway, and we quickly have been made aware that there's a, it's not a bug, right, because Google said it wasn't a bug. Um, it's possible to see if somebody has a public calendar. How many people in here use G Suite for their organization? Uh, so we quickly discovered with some help that if you have a public calendar, it'll return a status code of 
200. 200. Well, and if it's not public, <laughs> what will it return? 404. So all you need is a list of everybody's email in your company and the intrigue module that uh, Jay Cran wrote, and you can quickly check to see who in your organization might have an open calendar that yeah. anybody in the world can see. And just from talking to some people on some list, uh, it's going to be more than you expect. Yeah. So we promised a takeaway from, from the talk today, and we just, this is the takeaway. This was the one thing that we wanted to give you guys to take, is to make sure you check your, your public calendars so your calendars to make sure none of your users have them public. So a little bit of uh, a context on this too. By the way, if you go to the SAS Google Calendar Check module, um, you can go to github.com uh, slash intrigue.io uh, and you can find the intrigue code and that'll give you the URL. It's embedded into that particular task. One thing we're noticing, and this isn't the first time we've seen this happen, um, a, a broad array of uh, SaaS uh, applications and platforms uh, often end up building a, a, a config uh, capability on top of existing yep. user capability. So, so sometimes, if your calendar was ever set to public, uh, and they added the domain level setting to disable that after the fact, they didn't go back and disable all the open public calendars that have been misconfigured, maybe maybe un, unwittingly. Um, and this thing, th we did a. a project on Google Groups, yep. where it was very, very similar. Uh, they'd often been misconfigured for the domain, so all you really had to do is force browse to the domain, and a lot of those Google Groups uh, were publicly exposed that, you know, unwittingly. More and more SaaSes are coming up with the AWS shared responsibility model. Yeah. They're just not stating it as clearly, so if you give someone your data, you really need to, to go back and to double check, especially those SaaS administrators, to keep up on the change log notes to see when they change, uh, especially access features, so that you know where you're supposed to be. And ultimately, like you shouldn't be able to brute force this stuff. Like <laughs> you shouldn't be able to force browse to it. No nonce, nothing. It just gives you a 200 or a 404. Wait, that, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so let me give you a quick demo of the platform in use. And so let me just pop to one of these. And. Yeah, question. Uh, <laughs> so, so there's a bunch of things to think about. Um, so the question is, you know, is that the, is that the issue uh, or is that the case with all the different Google products? Uh, the, the answer is no, uh, probably. Yes. Yes. 100%. Again, again, of course, we would do that, and um, you know, oftentimes these these things where they have controls in place at the domain level are their way of handling this. And anyone who was misconfigured before those controls existed is on their own to fix that. So it's a privacy thing. It's not a security bug. It's a misconfiguration. And so. So, so I, I, the question is, you know, what do we do about this? Um, I would encourage anybody who's running a, a, a Google G Suite enabled yep. organization to check their uh, calendar privacy policies. settings. Yep. But remember, it's not sufficient to just check your Google uh, or ch <laughs> check your uh, check your domain level settings. Yeah, you actually need to go check the individual calendars, um, and that's certainly the case with this. That was the case with the Google um, Groups uh, issues. So I just I would encourage everybody to understand that the privacy settings may be rolled out after the fact, and you should think about things that have been exposed before those privacy settings were enabled. We're about out of time. Do you want to show this real quick? Yeah, yeah. Let me just do a quick run through. So um, here you're looking at the Yahoo organization, sort of like what we were showing the screenshots of, um, and you can uh, effectively pull this from Docker Hub. So you can just go grab it after the talk. Um, and uh, you know, like like we said, you create an entity. In this case, we do Yahoo.com. I've already done that here, so you'll see some things. Uh, so let's just browse to the entities page. This is all the stuff that's been found uh, for Yahoo. And notice there's kind of this interesting grouping here, because of the way we do uh, tracking of 
uh, DNS records and IP addresses. It lets us easily find load balancers, vhost, things like that, group those together. So effectively, all these DNS names are hosted on the same set of IP addresses, meaning they're load balanced together, right? And, you know, just kind of scrolling down here, let's actually look at an analysis view. And let's just go app technologies, right? And so it's building out, so this will take a little while to do. An average organization, a Fortune 500, can take, you know, hours or days even to build out. Um, but the nice thing is you can sort of browse around what's running Ruby at Yahoo. It looks like there's CC API Commerce Central, right, is running Ruby. Cool, there's a screenshot. And if we want to learn more about this, we can just run another task here. Maybe you want to spider it, right? And it'll give you some information here, some configuration settings. Kind of dig in, and then it'll kick off the task. And everything is, um, you can, it, it runs in parallel, so you, you have the ability to kick off many tasks at once. And let's just see what the issues were. I'm curious what these were. So it looks like it's found a bunch of S3 buckets. Um, those are probably all the same bucket. But basically, it sort of brings these issues together and, and presents them to you, so. And this is a really, really handy tool. When I first had the idea for the talk, it was really to put together a toolkit like this. And Jonathan just has this toolkit in a really nice wrapper. He likes to joke about it. he's not a designer, but the Intrigue UI is, is amazing. So like you said, you can grab it off of Docker and, and run it tonight. Um, uh, we're out of time. We'll take questions offline. We just want to say thank you guys for having us out today. We've really enjoyed being here and talking to you about uh, hunting for web application bugs. Cool. Thank you.